Hi, everybody. So good to be here uh, today. And I know you guys are soaking up so much information uh, today uh, on so many topics. And so I'm glad you're spending a little bit of time to think about values and about culture because it's very interesting that culture and values is one of the most talked about things in startups in Silicon Valley, is one of the most important things in building your company, and is one of the topics that I think has the most hand-waving and mystery around it that nobody actually understands. And so my attempt today, and actually I've not really given this talk before, but my attempt today is actually try to provide a framework and some learnings for what we've been through in our journey to articulate the values of Twilio and then uh, our attempts to live them every day. Sound good? So to start off, I want to give you some background in uh, our progression as a company and where we've been coming from. In uh, 2010, uh, I, I found a bunch of pictures. This is the, the, the small six-person company, roughly we were in 2010. You jump ahead a year later, we're about 35 people. Uh, about a year after that, we're about 70 people. Uh, then it, it needs to take up the whole screen, about 125 people, uh, 250. And the beginning of this year, we're close to 400 people, and we actually had to have a, uh, like a high school photographer take our picture on these very awkward uh, bleachers. Um, and I have no idea what the logistics are going to look like next year, but I still think this tradition of having the company picture is a fun one. And so to give you a sense of the growth trajectory that we've been on, we, we, you know, we've doubled, as you can see, many of these years. But very early on when we started growing Twilio, in fact, back in that 2010, that roughly six-person company, you know, I remember we um, you know, had just raised some money and we realized we were going to be hiring, uh, you know, starting to hire more people. And we actually sat down and we actively said, well, you know what, we should probably write down our values. And the reason why we said we should write down our values at that point in time, you know, sort of this observation. Every company has culture. Every company has values. But they may or may not be written down. They may or may not be documented. So while you have it, if they're not documented, they just are what they happen to be. And they will change, and they will morph, and they will go with the flow, and they will become what they're going to become. So we said, well, our goal is we may as well write them down. That way they're in our control. And so that was where this really started for us in 2010. And so we did. We sat down, we had a meeting, and we wrote down these five things. Continuous improvement, detail-oriented, learners, humble, hungry, we said these things sound really good as far as how we want to you know, attract people, the people we want to attract, the people we want to work with. These are some of the things that we saw in ourselves. We said, this sounds really good. And so we said, okay, these are our values. Let's go start hiring. And we did. We hired a whole bunch of people. Uh, you jump forward about a year and a half later, and an interesting thing happened. I was at a, a CEO summit from one of our investors, and we were doing an unconference style thing where we each uh, had you know, breakout sessions. And one of the sessions was about values and culture. And so I thought that was interesting. I went to that one. And I was talking to the other CEOs of some other awesome companies about our values. And one of the CEOs said, well, you know, those values sound really cool. Do you think if you asked an average Twilio employee what your values were, they'd be able to, um, they'd be able to tell you what they were? And I said, well, I don't know. I've never really done that before. Why don't we find out? So I pull up my phone and I dial a special phone number that is a conference line that auto-dials everybody in Twilio. We're Twilio, we have these things. And it dumps like the whole company into a conference call. And, and I just said, hey everybody, I need a volunteer. Someone volunteered. I said, okay, we'll call you back. We called her back and we put her on speakerphone. I said, you're on speakerphone with a bunch of other CEOs and we have a question for you. Can you name our values? And she thinks for a second, and she says, yeah, um, simple, easy, powerful. I said, okay, thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs> and she's, she says, did I do a good job? I said, you did fantastic. And I hung up the phone, and it was interesting because what I was thinking about is that she was speaking to our product. The words and after the last presentation, right, those, that notion of values of how you want people to think about your product, well, she was thinking about our product product, simple, powerful, easy, but I certainly would not describe the employees of Twilio as simple <laughs> or easy. <laughs> and so I realized there was this disconnect between what values mean to different people and to different aspects of your life as a company, right? 
And so I started to rethink, okay, if I really thought about holistically what Twilio is, how would I think about those values? And I realized that whatever I came up with uh, would probably have to speak to who the people are behind Twilio, uh, what our product is, and the various processes of the company. So I'll explain this for a minute. So first of all, people. Right? When you think about your know, values and your culture, right, you want these things to help you decide who you should hire, who you should fire, how you treat each other while you work together. Right? That's something that people often think about when they think of values. In fact, that's what we were thinking about at the beginning. Who should we hire? Right? But we weren't addressing the product. So what is the product at, uh, aspect of your values? Well, what products do you build? How do you treat your customers? How do you respond to threats and opportunities? Essentially, that's a part of your value system as well. Right? And lastly is processes. Right? So how do you make decisions as a company? How do you report out on progress? How do you hold people accountable? And I actually think when a lot of people think about culture, they miss this. They miss the fact that how you work together, how you get your work done, how you trust each other, is a tremendously important part of uh, the culture of your company. And so really we set out to say, okay, if we're going to have a value system, it should really incorporate people, product, and process. But the other thing I started thinking about, well, what is culture? You know, it's a word that we in Silicon Valley and startups everywhere toss around all the time. Culture this, culture that. What does it really mean? Well, what are values? What's the difference between these things? And really strive to understand what, how these things intersect with each other. And what I came up with is essentially is that culture is the living of your values. Culture is living values. Values are written words, and your culture is how you actually live those written words. And this is actually where mo most companies' values go astray. Because so many companies have values written on the wall, on posters, on coasters, on the back of your badge. But then how you live them is something entirely different. And so we set out to go articulate some values that we thought could guide us through the next stage of growth. And so I'm going to walk you through uh, what we've done uh, in three parts of the life cycle here. First is articulating those values. Second, our observations about living them. And third, our observations about changing them. So first, let's start off with articulating your values. I want to point out something very important. I didn't say creating your values. You cannot create your values. You cannot sit down and say, hey, what words sound good? Because that just makes them false. It just makes them empty words. So you cannot create your values. I use the word articulating very intentionally because I believe all you can do is introspect who you are and pull out the things that you like and articulate those things. But if you make up words, and you can be slightly aspirational in these things, but the seeds have to be there already. But if you literally are making up words that you think would be good values to have, but they're not real. So what you're doing is you're not creating anything, you're articulating something that's already there. Okay, so next, when is a good time to articulate your values? And my answer to that is, well, not too early and not too late. So I'll explain. If you do it too early, like if you said the first thing we're gonna do, we just incorporated, let's do our values. I actually think the company is not mature enough to articulate your values. You have not worked together long enough. You do not necessarily have enough people, uh, nor do you have enough maturity around the operating model of your company to successfully articulate those values. Because right? if you believe you cannot create values, you can only articulate well, what is there, well, you do have to have some ability for those things to bake before you can uh, successfully and correctly articulate them. Right? So I liken it to a, you know, the teenage years. Right? Every human being needs to go through the teenage years to try to discover yourself. Right? Make mistakes about who you are and what you stand for until you grow up into your late teenage years or early 20s when you've actually finally probably got it figured out and you're comfortable in your own skin. And I believe most startups actually go through that process as well. And if you try to articulate your values when you're six years old, right? probably not the best thing. When I was six, I think I wanted to be a garbage truck. <laughs> um, so right, you have, to, you have to give it time to bake in order to uh, know who you are as a company. But also not too late. Right? If you wait too long, 
then you've let the values probably go off in their own direction for too long, and now you may not like what you find when you introspect, right? So my recommendation to be tact uh, uh, tactical about it, you know, do it when you're 20, 30, 40 people. Don't do it when you're three, and don't do it when you're 500. Not too late, not too early. Okay, who? Whose job is it to articulate the values of the company? Uh, primarily, that job falls to no one else but the CEO. However, it is not your job alone. And in fact, if you think it's your job alone, I suspect you will fail. Um, so my advice here is you need to be inclusive because they are not your values, founder or CEO. They're the tribe's values. What you're doing is you're creating a tribe. Human beings are tribal creatures. Right? We like being in tribes. Why? Because in the early days of humanity, you had to be a part of a tribe to survive. You had to fit in. In fact, being ejected from the tribe meant death. And so we are tribal creatures, and we strive to be parts of tribes. This is why you see people, you know, Dodgers versus Giants, right? People wanting to be tribal. Emacs versus Vim. People want to be tribal, right? America. Tribal, right? We want to be parts of groups. And so what you're really doing is defining the values of your group. But keep in mind, you can't do that alone because the group has to be bought into these values as well. And so what I did at Twilio was um, we took a uh, working group. I, I, I grabbed about a dozen people from around the company who I thought would have a good mind and I thought cared about the long term of the company and uh, had a, a session. We, had, we got dinner, so they wanted to come. And I said, here's what we're, here's what we're working on. We're articulating the uh, values of the company. And so what I want to do here is I just want to talk about what are the things that you value about your interactions with each other, uh, the kind of people we like to have here, et cetera. And we just brainstormed. We wrote down probably 100 ideas. I said, thank you very much. That's perfect. Uh, and they said, well, is that, are those our values? I said, no, 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 we'll follow up. And what I did is I took those things and I kind of grouped them together, uh, did some editing, right? My job is as the editor and the curator of this process. I curated it down, combined a lot of ideas together. And then two weeks later, we had another um, one of these meetings. And I said, okay, based on what we talked about last time, curated it down to this tw these 25 values. Let's talk about them. And we talked about which ones were good, which ones were bad, which ones captured it. We ended up combining some. We ended up getting rid of some. Okay? Said so thank you for the feedback. Did another round of editing. Came back the next time with about 10 values and said, which of these couldn't you live without? Which of these could you live without? And then based on that last round of feedback, we ended up with nine things. And so that iterative process of being inclusive and getting the, the tribe bought in on the creation of the values and the articulation of them, I think was very important. Because then when we rolled them out to the company, there were a lot of people who were uh, invested in the success of these values because they were a part of drafting them. And I actually, when we rolled them out in all hands, I actually had folks from around the company who were involved in that process be the ones to introduce those values. So it wasn't me. It was coming from the group. And I think that was a very important part of it getting accepted as opposed to, you know, Moses coming down from the mountain with the tablets, right? Um, so I think that was an important thing. Okay, now, how would you articulate them? What words do you use? There's a lot of words in the English language to describe things. How do you decide which ones to use? Okay, uh, so let's start, first of all, with um, a corporate example. Respect, communication, integrity, and excellence. Can anyone guess what company this is? Does anybody know? Famous, yes, it's Enron, right? So this just goes to show you that on paper, all values look good, right? Because those values look perfectly reasonable. I'm sure you could apply them to all your companies. You would say, yeah, I want people to do those things. On paper, they all look good, but living them, I believe, starts with articulating them in a livable way. So the words you use here matter a lot. And my advice is to use human actionable words. So here are Twilio's nine things. Live the spirit of challenge, empower others, start with why, create experiences, no shenanigans, be humble, think at scale, draw the owl, be frugal. And we landed on many of these uh, words because we felt that the people at Twilio and really any human being can understand. These are human scale words that you can live. Uh, and one of them you may be wondering about, draw the owl. Um, this came from an internet meme that went around Twilio like wildfire in the early days that we all loved. How to draw an owl. Step one, draw some circles. Step two, draw the rest of the... No. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's like, we actually interest, like, why do we think this is so funny? It was just a meme. Like, it was like people were emailing it around. Like, someone would send an email to the whole company, like, hey, does anybody know how to do this? And someone reply with, with this picture. <laughs> We'd be like, why is that funny? Why do we all get it? Like, what's going on here? And we introspected, we're like, well, this is a great representation of our job, what we do every day. Like, there's no instruction book. No one's going to come here and just tell us, paint by number, here's how to do the job, right? Part of the opportunity and the fun of a startup is you got to figure it out yourself. So we actually ended up baking this into the values. And so you can see this is an example of using these sort of human actionable words. And a lot of companies, you know, there's a lot of parallels actually between the at least supposed values of Enron and the values of Tulio. In fact, I'm able to map their values directly to ours. But I can show you why I think ours are better. So at Enron, you had respect. Sounds good. How do I, am I being respectful right now? I don't know. But at Tulio, we have be humble. It's a more specific version of respect. And it's actionable. We all know what humble is. We all know what humble is not. We have a pretty good sense for that. And so at Tulio, when we say be humble, are we being humble? Um, that's able to take on meaning. But respect is such a vague word. It's so hard to understand if what we're doing is respectful. Here's an even better example of that, integrity. How many people know what integrity means? How many of you really know what integrity means? I don't know what it means. Like, I get it at a conceptual hand wavy view, but I don't really know if what I'm doing has integrity right now. However, at Tulio, we have a concept, no shenanigans. Right? People know if, this is, you know if they're doing something that's shenanigans. We've got an internal, like, we have a gut feel, like, that's shenanigans. Um, and so we can, we can do that, right? Same thing, if communication at Enron, at Tulio, we have start with why. It is a more specific, actionable aspect of communication. Start with why says understanding why we're doing something is critically important. And so it is a very valid question to ask at Twilio, why? But communication is so vague that it's meaningless. Last, excellence. Who's being excellent right now? This is good if you're Wayne and Garth, it is not good if you're building a company. Um, what you have is, for Twilio, is that draw the owl motion. It's more specific, it is more actionable, it has more meaning. And we took this notion of human scale words and actually applied them to the values themselves, right? We had, did not call these things our core values because this word has been ruined. Nobody really understands what core values are anymore because everyone's worked at companies that had them and were meaningless. And so we, we killed that and we called them our nine things, right? Because we wanted to detach our values from what most people thought of as stupid values. So again, using words that people could understand, things. I guess it's a, you know, it's a vague enough word, but at least we could own it, right? It's not nine things. Everyone says nine things, we know what that's about. And I'm gonna make a book recommendation now. So a lot of the work that I've done um, in you know, articulating values and using these words, uh, but also in some of the marketing and, and, and aspects of Twilio is really influenced by this book that I read early on in Twilio's life cycle called Made to Stick. Um, and it is a book about, it is not a, like a values or an HR or entrepreneurship book. It's just how to tell a story, how to articulate ideas that people will remember. And I found that this comes in incredibly handy in a wide variety of the activities that you do as entrepreneurs, whether it's doing the marketing, the branding of your uh, product, whether it is uh, pitching investors, or whether it's pitching your employees on what the values of the company should be. Made to Stick is a really good book. I recommend you all get it. That's $13 you'll spend. Okay, uh, next tip on artic articulating the values, use verbs. So a word like communication or integrity, they're not actionable. They're nouns. But at Twilio, we used verbs. Draw the owl. Be frugal. Start with why. Why? A, they're action-oriented, so they, they, they resonate better, but they feel more implementable when they are in action. So use verbs. That was very intentional for us. Uh, the last question is, how many should we have? Not too many and not too few. Now, you've probably heard the notion that as human beings, we can remember seven plus or minus two things. So at our nine things, we are clearly tipping the scales of how many are a reasonable number of values. And if you asked an average Twilio employee today, can you name our nine things? The answer is probably no. In fact, if, I, if you asked me to name our nine things without having a cheat sheet, I would probably forget a few and I'd sit there scratching my head, wait, which one did I forget? Okay, so nine is a lot. The way I've thought about it though, is that people will pick the ones that are most, resonate most with them and they will live those most fully. 
and I've thought that that's okay. But here's why. You would say, Jeff, why don't you just go three or five? The problem is this. When you try to um, narrow it down to such a small number of things, what you end up doing is making that small number of things more and more abstracted from what you really want to say. Right? So instead of uh, draw the owl, you'll end up with you know, integrity or something. Right? So you'll end up with these uh, overarching umbrella words that encapsulate so many ideas because you're trying to narrow everything down to just three words that the words then become meaningless. And so it's a struggle between having more specific, actionable values on one end, and the other end is having fewer, more abstracted concepts. And everybody has to pick somewhere in the middle that makes sense. We happen to have nine. All right, so next, living the values. First of all, there's no shortcuts. It's just you. That's my first fundamental belief. You as the founders, you as the CEO, you are the person who exemplify the values. If you are not living them, nobody else will. Rule number one, dead stop, is that obvious? You get that? Everyone looks at everything you do, right? So if you are not living them, then it's, it's all over. Okay, next people ask, how do you hire people who exhibit your values? My answer is, I don't believe your goal is to hire people who exhibit your values. I believe your goal is to hire people who are not incapable of living your values. Right? You hire people who are compatible, who are capable of living your values. They may not live them today, and that's fine. Because again, we are tribal creatures. We want to fit in. So whatever company they're at today, they are likely, you know, unconsciously trying to fit into that culture. And when they come into your company, if they are not incapable of it, they will probably try really hard to fit in with the values of your culture. And that's okay. But if you say, hey, I'm looking for a direct one-to-one -one match, you, one, run the risk of hiring people who look and sound exactly like you, which we know is not the right way to build a company. But number two, you're going to rule out a lot of good people. So your job as onboarding and uh, as running a company is to train people on how they can fit into your values. And your job is to weed out people who are incompatible with your values. And I'd focus your hiring energy on that. How do I weed out people who are incompatible? Now, there's a good question. What do you do when somebody uh, who is compatible with your values uh, but isn't living them? Now, it should go without saying that if somebody is not living your values and is not capable of living your values, then you should, you should exit them. And they will find a better place where they will be more successful and the company will be better off. And this gets really hard when that person is a high performer at their job. But I won't waste your time by telling you you all know the right thing to do when that happens. You exit them. But what I will say, one of the hard things is when someone who is capable of living the values and isn't, what do you do in those scenarios? How do you get somebody back to living the values? And the first thing I have to say is you correct them immediately when you can. And my favorite example of how to do this comes from a book, uh, another book that I read early on in Twilio that I think was very um, uh, impactful on me. It's called Setting the Table by Danny Meyer, a successful uh, New York entrepreneur, uh, restaurateur who's talking about how to bring service businesses, how to make the customer feel special, how to make a service business work. And the story he tells is as a young restaurateur going into the restaurant of a very established restaurateur at the time and seeing all the employees doing exactly the right thing to be hospitable to their guests. And the uh, Danny, young Danny Meyer says, how do you get them all on the same page? How do you get them doing the right thing? And he says, let me show you. And he clears the table and he says, put the salt shaker in the middle of the table. Danny puts the salt shaker in the middle of the table. He then moves the salt shaker off the middle. And he says, where's the salt shaker? He says, well, it's over there. He says, well, put it in the middle. He moves it, he puts it back in the middle. The restaurateur moves it off again. He says, where's the salt shaker? And like, he does this like five or six times about the time Danny is gonna say like, You're, what, what's going on here? He says, here's the point. Your staff and your guests are always moving your salt shaker off center. That is what they do. That's their job. It's the job of life. It's the law of entropy. Until you understand that, you're going to get pissed off every time someone moves the salt shaker off center. It is not your job to get upset. You just need to understand that's what they do. Your job is just to move the salt shaker back each time and let them know exactly what you stand for. Let them know what excellence looks like. 
And that paragraph there, to me, exemplifies what you do with your values. You don't get mad. You just put the salt shaker back in the middle, and people get the message. All right, living the values, sanity check. How do you know if your values are working? How do you know if they're meaningful? So first of all, hearing them in the hallways, hearing them in decision-making processes, hearing them externally. These are the signals that these things are working. So keep your eye open, pay attention. I'll show you a few examples. No shenanigans, I mentioned it before. I hear this in the decision-making processes of Tulio all the time. We thought about this, but we thought it would be shenanigans. So we went with that. Okay, that's good. It's working. It's doing its job. People are making decisions based on the values you set out. Be frugal. One of my favorite examples of knowing your culture is working when people outside the company can observe it, who haven't even you know, been a part of the company of the onboarding. And so be frugal. We had this article in Recode just a couple of weeks ago, which I, was, I loved it. Um, Lunches with unicorns. I was already like, not too excited about this piece. Tulio foregoes flash for frugality. Right? And these are the observations of a reporter. And I'll read this to you. As a newly anointed unicorn, messaging company Tulio, the secret sauce behind Uber and Airbnb, resides in a far from luxurious building. It's located in you know, Soma, which stands for South of Market. But instead of a spot in an airy refurbished warehouse, Tulio's pad is tucked in the back of a dingy structure. Grungy beige carpet covers the hallways on the way in. A moldy smell permeates the air, and a battered orange cone stands guard next to the service elevator up to the office, right? And, like, you know, a lot of people be horrified with this description of their company. I'm actually proud. It means our values are being lived and are visible to those who observe. And uh, Draw the Owl this is another one of my favorite examples. Some employees took it on their own to create a mural in our office, literally drawing the owl. Uh, and so I thought that was really cool. So when you see these signs, people doing, invoking the values on their own, without prompting, right, that's where you know it's going well. What about when you get unintended consequences of your values? Because this will happen. People will interpret your values in ways you never anticipated. This is the antithesis of when they're doing, you know, when they're invoking the values in the right way, they invoke the values in the wrong way. I'll give you an example. Draw the owl. There's no instruction book, it's ours to draw, so figure it out, ship it, and iterate. So at one point, several years ago, I could point you at Twilio's five build and release systems for our software. Why? Because every team who had a build and release problem said, hey, the one that exists is just slightly not what we want, so we're gonna draw the owl and build our own. And the end result was you had various degrees of quality, of, of test coverage, of, of uh, availability of those systems, and like, it was a mess. And when I looked at it like from the outside, I kind of got wind of it, I was like, why the hell would we have five build systems? This is stupid. And the response I got from a place was, well, draw the owl. We had a problem, we solved it. I said, oh, that's really interesting. I never would have thought that draw the owl would be interpreted in a way that, you know, in retrospect looks Kind of silly. And so we ended up saying, well, it is actually good to draw the owl. Like, it is good to solve the problem, but then at some point, it's the leadership's job in the company to look in, see that happening, and realize that there's a problem that needs to be solved, and to go in and solve it in a more holistic, thorough way. Uh, next is, um, I'll point out this one, uh, be frugal. Uh, this is actually not a problem that I have, but I've seen it so many other places where people have this frugality notion, but then they apply it in exactly the wrong way. How many of you have a Hanes beefy tea in your uh, Goodwill pile at home <laughs> that you got a swag from a company, right? And this is a really interesting one. A lot of people would say, well, be frugal. We should get the Hanes beefy tea. It's $5, right? We're not going to get the American apparel, which is seven, because $5 is less than seven. But the correct answer is, well, $5 that gets thrown away is not being frugal. But $7 that actually is appreciated by the customer you give it to is a much val more valuable use of your money. Uh, and so it takes some forethought to think about, hey, the values, but we still need to apply them intelligently, right? And so keep your eye out for ways in which values are going and being interpreted in ways that you did not imagine. Okay, the last thing that I'll, I'll mention here is changing your values. Okay, so you set out, you articulated your values, and now you've lived with them for a few years, and you realize that it may not be exactly what you want. This happens. How are you expected to perfectly articulate your values at one point in time when so many things are changing. The size of your company, yourself as a person, as an entrepreneur, you're changing, right? And so my advice here is you should be open to changing your values. 
not too often. If you change them too often, if you change them quarterly, they're no longer your values. They're like strategies, right? So in order to be meaningful as values, you need to keep them. They need to be continuous. There needs to be continuity there. But you can change them. Just don't do it too often. Maybe every couple years you'll do some tweaks. Let me show you what we did. Uh, these are two of our values which I actually don't particularly like. Live the spirit of challenge. I love the idea behind this one. The words I don't believe are actionable. And I don't hear this one invoked around the company. I don't hear people say, yep, we're living the spirit of challenge today. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think, the words here don't make sense. Right? And so I'd like to change this. The other one, think at scale. Uh, this is a very mixed message. The intent was to say, think about where we're going and build and, and plan for the future and think big. But in reality, you're actually giving a, a free pass to people to not think iteratively, you know, never ship the prototype, never ship V1, V2, V3, right? You're basically saying, hey, solve it perfectly forever, which is not a good message to send. And so these are two things I wanted to change. And so about a year ago, I actually approached in a similar way to how I did the uh, initial set of values. I approached people around the company and said, hey, if we were to uh, change some of these values, how would you, uh, what would we change them to? And you would not believe what happened. People were so violently against changing them. I could not get anyone to budge. And again, going back to this, the tribe's values, it's not mine. I can't just force these changes. And so I tried to, but people were so attached to them because they've been living them every day. So I did something else. I created what I called the leadership principles to solve a different problem. The values talk to how we interact with each other, but the leadership principles are how we grow ourselves. So I created a new construct. I called them the LPs, and I got some of the things that I felt were missing from our values into this one. Sounds like a good idea. They were well-received, and we're actually doing a lot of our interviewing and our performance reviews and things like that are based on these things now, uh, which is nice, except for one problem. There's nine things and eight leadership principles. We have 17 things now, which is way too many. And my answer is, I do not have an answer for this yet. <laughs> this is the state of the union at Twilio today. We have 17 things that you have to live by. And uh, next year, if I'm invited back, I will tell you how this ends up. Uh, so in closing, every company has a culture and every company has values, whether or not you articulate them. So my advice is you might as well articulate them so that they stay in your control and you can grow them. Thank you very much.